Now that we have the data organized for the different conditions, we are going to do some statistical analyses. In particular, we are going to do a t-test on the differences in bold activity between conditions 1 and 6, and we're going to do this at time point 6 seconds, which roughly corresponds to the peak of the event-related bold response, which you saw in the previous video. Now, before going any further, I want to say that a t-test on a particular time point in an event-related bold experiment is not exactly the best way to analyze event-related fMRI data. It's not really wrong per se, but you can see that there's a lot of meaningful variance in the entire time course that the t-test on a single time point is going to ignore. And furthermore, closely spaced events in the experiment can create overlapping time courses across different conditions. Now, a full GLM, a full general linear model, can account for both of these phenomena, and the single time point t-test doesn't. So, that said, the t-test is one of the most important and fundamental statistical tests, and I want to show you how easy it is to implement the t-test in MATLAB. So I'm taking a little bit of liberty here because this is a course on MATLAB coding, not on cutting-edge fMRI statistical modeling. Anyway, here is the basic formula for a t-test. It is the difference between the means of the two conditions divided by the standard deviation and the sample size. So this is the most basic formulation of the t-test. The denominator can get pretty complicated depending on whether these are paired samples, whether they have equal or unequal variance or unequal or equal sample sizes and so on. But this formula gives you the main conceptual idea. Of course, MATLAB takes care of all the mathematical details, including computing p-values corresponding to these t-values. So what we are going to do is compute the t-test comparing these two conditions at every single one of these voxels. So not just at one voxel that we hand select, but we're going to run the t-test at every single voxel. And then we will display the results as an image, which you can see here. So the way that I've set up this test, blue corresponds to more activity for condition 6 compared to condition 1, and red means more activity for condition 1 compared to condition 6. So this map shows that there is stronger activity near the calcarine sulcus for rings that were closer to the fovea and more activity further away for rings that were also further away from the fovea. Of course, this isn't surprising given what you see in these two maps here. In fact, the numerator of the t-test is literally just the subtraction of these two maps. The advantage here of this t-test is that we can scale by the variance and also we can apply statistical thresholding. In particular, I have set to zero any pixels that have a p-value larger than 0.01. Now, you can also see we have this uh, blue, white, red color map. This is not a standard MATLAB color map. I've downloaded it and it's bundled with the course code, so you will get it online. This color map is fairly often used in neuroscience, and it's also just an excuse to show you how to work with non-standard color maps. By the way, one thing that I like about this map here is it looks a bit like the UK, don't you think? So here's England down here and Wales and Scotland up here, and this is Ireland over here. Well, anyway, let's get back to doing serious neuroscience education. So we switch to MATLAB and start coding. As always, it's useful to have a quick glance through the code to try and understand the, the big picture overview of where we're going with this code before worrying about all of the nitty gritty details. And actually, I'm gonna close all these figures again. We don't need any of those here. Okay, so we are initializing maps, and uh, we're initializing them to be empty, and then it looks like we're looping over the experiment runs. Remember, we have four experiment runs. Within each of these runs, we're going to find all of the occurrences of these two events that we are interested in. So event one and event six, we have to grab that from the design matrix. And then it looks like we are uh, getting the data from six TRs post-stimulus onset. And it looks like one line of code is basically done for us. This is the cat function, which is not the animal cat. This is for concatenate. 
And you can see we have the same variable here. So we are basically uh, allowing this variable to grow larger and larger inside this for loop here. Okay, so we'll need to do a little bit of work here. I'll explain this to make sure that uh, you understand what's going on in this function. And then we have the t-test, so you can see how simple it is to run a t-test in MATLAB. And we have uh, an important note, so you know it looks like this line of code is complete, but maybe there's something wrong here that we will have to inspect and uh, adjust. Okay, and then uh, I think the rest of the code, uh, once we get to this t-test stuff, the rest of this is, is a little bit more straightforward. You can recognize a lot of the code for translating the data from vector into matrix, which we've been doing several times, and uh, yeah, some, some setting up of, of colors. Okay, so let's go back and start working through this code line by line. So initialize the maps to empty, and then we run, oh, we loop over experiment run. So again, I'm just going to set this looping index variable to be the first value, which is one, and that allows us to run through the code line by line. Okay, so find all occurrences of events one and six. Now, this is something that we have done in a previous video. So remember, the design matrix is a matrix of time points by conditions and it tells us when each condition appeared in the matrix so we want to find all of the non-zero events that happen anywhere in time in the first column and this tells us that for the first run there are events so these are the time points in tr so the time indices at which stimulus one appeared so then we do the same thing here i'm going to copy and paste and whenever you're copying and pasting code it's super duper important to make sure that you are methodically checking everything that needs to change because it's a really easy mistake to forget to change this to a six and then you know you continue going on with the code like this okay so this needs to be six and now we're looking for events one so the onset of events one and the onset of events six it's also good to visually confirm quickly that these are indeed different vectors. If these were the same numbers, then we would have made a, a mistake somewhere in here. Okay, so now what we want to do is go back to the data for this run, and we want all of the voxels and these events corresponding to you know these two conditions, and then we want plus six. So six TRs after the stimulus onset. Here, so let's actually just copy and paste this code, you can often gain insights into confusing MATLAB code just by looking at the sizes of different variables. So here we have the size of this little thing in here, this little piece of code, and this is voxels by 12. Now where does this 12 come from? Well, we can see that events one is a 12 element vector. So that means that condition one appeared 12 times in run one. So this is 12 snapshots of data at stimulus onset plus six seconds corresponding to each stimulus presentation. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, we're going to concatenate the existing map, which we in initialize as being empty. So it starts off as being nothing. And the two here corresponds to the dimension in which we are concatenating over. So what do we want to concatenate over? Well, for a t-test, we want to have the features and the observations. So the features are the voxels and the observations are the trials. But the thing is we want to concatenate the data from all of the runs. So therefore we want this to increase in size over the four runs. Okay, so let's run this. So now map one was initialized as empty. I'm gonna run this line of code. Now we see that, uh, well, because this is empty, this is actually now the same thing. But we can run this line of code again and again, and again, and again, you know, this is uh, all repetitive data. So, I'm, I'm, you know, we're not going to actually work with this, but you can see that the resulting matrix map one is voxels by, now it's by 48 because I concatenated the same matrix four times and I concatenated along the second dimension. So the voxels are preserved and the observation count increases. Okay, very nice. So now this is obviously the same thing here. So we concatenate map six and then this is events six instead of events one. Okay, so now I have to run all of this code again, including initializing the maps to be empty. And actually, you know, I will intentionally not run these two lines of code just so we can see what happens. Now, 
Map one is 96 elements in the second dimension, and map six is 48 elements. Now map one actually contains twice as many data points that are redundant, right? Because I manually ran this code over and over again. Okay, so that shows that we need to initialize these to be empty, and now we can confirm that they are the same size. There's 48 trials in both cases over all four runs. Okay, so now we're ready to run the t-test. So to run the t-test, we're gonna do a two-sample t-test. Uh, sorry, I said two-sample t-test. I meant to say a paired sample t-test. This is a paired sample t-test on these two data matrices. Now, how do we know whether we should input these matrices as features by observations or observations by features? Well, one way we can do this is by looking at the help file for the t-test and see what it says about in, uh, matrix inputs. However, I wanna do this a slightly different way. I wanna use our statistical knowledge to do some, uh, some trial and error guessing and figure this out by trial and error. So the t-test is going to output optionally four outputs. The little tilde here means that I'm ignoring or suppressing the output for the first output and the third output. So this is going to be the p values and this is going to be the t map. Okay, so I'm gonna run this line of code. Now, first of all, notice that it didn't produce any errors or warning messages. So that means we haven't made any coding mistakes. It's possible that we've made a, a statistical mistake, but we haven't made any coding mistakes. So let's think about what is the size of the t values and the p values that we expect here. Well, if we have voxels by time points, uh, or by trials, then we expect to have the number of t values and a number of p values corresponding to the number of voxels. That makes sense, right? We get a t value and a p value for each voxel. However, when we look at the size of this p value vector, you can see that it's actually one by 48. So this corresponds to the number of observations. And same with the t map, we have one by 48 for these results. Okay, so that means that we need to transpose. Again, we could have figured this out by looking at the help file for the t-test, but I think it's also useful to get some experience with thinking critically and sanity checking your data according to what the results, or at least the sizes of the results should be. Okay, so now we look again and we see that the p vector is a, uh, a, a vector with the number of elements corresponding to the number of voxels. Okay, same with tmap. Okay, now we are ready for some visualization. So what we wanna do is create a T map and that's done by extracting some information out of the T map structure, which was the fourth output of T test. So we can see that it has T stat, DF, which stands for degrees of freedom, SD, which stands for the standard deviations. So in this case, we want the actual T values themselves. So let's write T stat. So this gives us our uh, vector of t values. And we can actually just plot this vector. Now this is not going to be a um, spatially interpretable vector. It's just all of the voxels that we have laid out. So we know from our knowledge of statistics that a t value, you know, I, I, we'd have to see what the degrees of freedom are, but t values probably somewhere larger than three-ish are going to be statistically significant. So a lot of non-significant results and also a lot of significant results in here. So next we want to apply some statistical thresholding. We're gonna set all of the voxels with a p-value larger than 0.01 to be zero. And actually let's also plot the, plot the p-values while we're doing this. So here you see the p-values, you can see they range quite a bit. So there's some very small p-values. Maybe I'll do this as dots actually, it might be more informative. So quite a range of p-values. Now everything that's larger than 0.05 would be non-significant. Of course, we, you know, in, in real fMRI analyses, you have to worry about controlling for multiple comparisons. We're doing, you know, 120,000 uh, statistical tests here. But, you know, for right now, uh, for teaching purposes, we're just gonna set the p-value to be 0.01 without worrying about corrections for multiple comparisons. Okay, so I'm going to write t-vals something equals zero. So what we want to do is use logical indexing here to find all of the p-values that are greater than 0.01 and set the indices where the p-value is greater than 0.01 to be equal to zero. 
So run that, and then we can plot the t vowels again, and also do this as dots. So now you see that uh, there's this big gap here. So these are all of the uh, pixels that we consider to be non-significant, and then they're all set to zero. Now, this is not anatomically interpretable, so therefore we need to convert this back to our uh, two-dimensional matrix and then make an image of this matrix. Very good. So we set the color limit here, and now I'm calling color map. So previously, you know, we've been using color map function to call different color maps like jet or, you know, there's also uh, copper, for example, is a nice one. But we are going to use the color map called blue, white, red. And you can see I'm providing an input of 64. So this is going to give us 64 discretizations of color values. So let's first run this and make sure that it looks good. So this does, this looks like the image that I showed in the slides. And I just wanna show you what it looks like, what the effect is of having a different discretization of color. So for example, if I only input four, you can see that now there's only four possible color values. And in fact, we can add a color bar here. That's gonna make it a little bit more clear. So uh, color bar. So add that color bar. Now you see we've discretized this color map into four values, and it didn't even do a very good job. So four is clearly not enough. So let's try maybe uh, 14. So this looks better. It's still a little bit blocky for my taste. We can try 140. Now, you know, this is starting to get too much. So it's an open question of, you know, how many discretizations you need. I guess 50 also looks pretty good. Okay, and then the last thing is, yeah, just to add some standard code here. So we run uh, axis image for equal uh, data aspect ratio and axis off, that's going to turn off the, uh, the, the, the black lines surrounding the axis and as well as the axis labels. And now I'm writing set GCF. So often when we are setting things, we are setting properties of an axis, so it's GCA. In this case, I'm gonna set the, a property of the figure. Notice it, the figure itself is gray, and then the axis is white on top. So I want this all to be white. So I'm gonna set the figure color to be white. And then finally, a uh, title saying that we want a t-test, or that we're showing a t-test on the difference between these two conditions. And that concludes module four on fMRI data in MATLAB. I hope you found this module instructive and enjoyable, and I hope you'll join me for the next module.